Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name's Ian, and I, until very recently, was the physiotherapist in the Diabetes Comprehensive Care Program. So I was that for a couple of years, I guess three or four. Uh, so I worked with folks in hemodialysis as well as on the inpatient unit if they were admitted, often with dialysis-related issues, but um, so I was the only physiotherapist in this program. I've done this presentation a few times, but I've updated it a little bit for you guys. Um, I think the way, oh, and I'll introduce my co-presenter. Yeah. So this is Celia. She's actually taking over the role. So she'll be the, the physiotherapist in the program for the foreseeable future, which is wonderful. We're very lucky to have Celia. She's been here at St. Michael's for about 10 years in the orthopedics program. So she comes with a, a lot of experience. So that's wonderful. Um, so yeah, so I think the way today is going to go is we'll do the presentation at first. There's a video at the beginning too that's about nine minutes long. Some of you might have seen it. It's got about five million views on uh, YouTube. So some of you might have seen it. Pardon me? Oh. Um, and then after that, I'll finish the presentation. And Sally is going to go through a bit of an exercise program just because I feel like talking about exercise gets a little boring. So it's nice to get up and do some. So if you have any questions throughout, please just let me know. You can stick your hand up. I'm happy to answer questions the whole time because I know from my own experience that trying to answer them at the end, sometimes I forget the question that I had in the middle of the presentation. So please just stick up your hand if you have any questions. Okay. So again, I introduced myself. And just with a quick show of hands, um, are you guys active? And so for instance, put up your hand if you do an exercise class or something like that. Yeah, there we go. We got one, two. Perfect. Um, does anybody swim? And I know with, yep, perfect. There's one. Um, housekeeping or gardening? Yeah. I'm a gardener. I love gardening. Yeah. Yeah. I need to plant my garlic soon. Um, walking? Anybody a big walker? Yeah, we got a few. Perfect. Yeah, that's a good one. We'll hear a lot about walking. And then who would say they don't do very much physical activity? Be honest. I don't do as much as I should, but OK. So here's our video. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and welcome to this visual lecture I'm calling 23 and a half hours. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word. Uh, weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all of these things are incredibly important, and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category. But I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What has the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? So I did my research, and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked out this intervention, and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems, and that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list. So this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Postmenopausal women who had four hours a week of the treatment had a 41% reduction in the risk of hip fracture. It reduced anxiety by 48% in a big meta-analysis. Patients suffering from depression, 30% were relieved uh, with low dose and that bumped to 47% as we uh, increased the dose. Um, following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue. And of course, the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life, which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better. And this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day, so there's 24 hours, and so you might spend most of your day, you know, this varies obviously, but, uh, you know, couch surfing, sitting at work, obviously sleeping. And what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is 
the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active, maybe an hour, and that uh, if you can do that, you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slides. So let's just take a quick walk through some of the literature. So Stephen Blair, uh, he's a professor at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, and he looked at this in what's called the aerobic center longitudinal study, which followed over 50,000 men and women over time. And uh, along the less left side of this graph is something called attributable fractions, which is a kind of fancy word, but it's the estimate of the number of deaths in a population that would have been avoided if that specific risk factor had been erased. So for example, turning a smoker into a non-smoker or a couch potato into a daily walker. And along the bottom is the typical risk factors. You can see the uh, hypertension is incredibly important and so on and so forth. But the one that was most, that kind of applied the most risk was this sort of mysterious CRF, which is cardiorespiratory fitness, which is really low fitness. So low fitness was the strongest predictor of death. And, and this is important that most of the trials we see, to be honest, are funded by uh, pharma or, or um, other companies because they've got a drug for hypertension or high cholesterol or diabetes. And we rarely see fitness thrown into the mix. And so it's nice to see uh, a trial that's not so uh, siloed. I, I, Blair's work is interesting. He also did another uh, trial looking at um, uh, obesity. What he found was, you know, sort of two things. One is obesity and no exercise, that's a very bad combination. And that's where we saw many of the negative consequences of obesity from a health point of view. But if the if the obese person was active, even if they didn't have the weight loss, but were just active and obese, that was much, much better and that the that the exercise ameliorated much of the negative consequences of uh, obesity. Um, so if exercise is a medicine, what's a dose? So when I think of, of, of dose, I think of how long, how often, and how intense. I'm going to give you a slightly mixed message, but essentially uh, more activity is better. But I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more if you're a kid, an hour a day if you're a kid, my flag goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that... Um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush, uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something, and after that, the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, woman who went from zero activity to just one hour a week uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down, so it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, if you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise, so it can be broken into three higher intensity, it looks like it's it's equivalent to less time with lower intensity. Uh, but I think uh, the, obviously the clinical pearl is mostly thinking about your, your style and habits and your personal cues. So if you're only going to do it if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve the 150 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs and so on and so forth. So thinking about that, I'm just going to walk you through some quick uh, slices of the literature. Uh, the first one comes from Japan. In, in, the, in the 90s, uh, Japan required all employers to conduct annual health screens for uh, their employees. And so a large gas company in Japan called Osaka uh, used this to answer a great question. Um, so if people's walk to work was longer, did that reduce their chance of serious health problems? So in this example, high blood pressure. And what they found is under 10 minute walk, no difference. 11 to 20 minute walk, 12% reduction in rates of high blood pressure or hypertension. And over 21 minute walk, a 29% decrease in rates of high blood pressure. So uh, the authors calculated that for every increase of 10 minutes in your walk to work, there was a 12% reduction in the likelihood of getting high blood pressure. The second exhibit is uh, looking at stents. So this is something we commonly do down medicine. So you can see on the left here, the arteries blocked. On the right, a vascular surgeon's gone in and uh, put in a balloon, opened it up, and left a stent to keep it open, which makes great sense. So a German researcher named Reiner Hambrecht uh, looked at this with about 100 cardiac patients. He got half the group to exercise, and by that I mean 20 minutes a day on an exercise bicycle, and then once weekly, 60-minute aerobics class. And the other half got the high-tech stent and just their sort of normal activity. And after one year, 88% of the exercises were event-free compared to 70% of the people that got a stent. Um, so both worked, uh, but I find it you know, sort of incredible that the, uh, the low-tech uh, made a bigger difference. And you have to remember that the stent just fixes one part of the heart.
The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease. We know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this, and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found compared with persons who watch no TV, those that spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? Uh, and it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, th I, th I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm just going to leave you with, uh, well, I guess, two quotes. So one is Jerry Garcia, the, the, the singer who is the lead singer for the Grateful Dead. And he said, somebody has to do something. It's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. And I, I think that's true, that it, in some ways it has to be us. As Hippocrates said, uh, walking is man's best medicine. And so I'm going to finish by asking you a question. And this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both, and you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. But um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So something to think about. Thank you very much. Yeah, so that's that. I thought the first time I saw that video, I thought it was pretty powerful. If you write anything oh. on your computer, you uh oh, here we go. I write pretty much all day. There we go. Um, and it's certainly something I try and build into my day, but I know that everybody's got their own challenges. Like you said, some people are busy with kids, some people have pain, some people are fatigued. And we're going to walk through a few of the challenges that um, patients with chronic kidney disease often face when they're trying to do exercise. Um, so first though, let's talk about just walk it back a little bit and no pun intended uh, and talk about physical activity. Um, and so what is physical activity when you hear about physical activity? Physical activity is literally anything that you do, any movement that your body does um, that involves some sort of physical exertion. So when you're carrying that laundry basket um, and you're starting to sweat, and man, this is a heavy, this is a lot of laundry. I got like three loads here. That's, that's physical activity. When you're gardening and you've got a lot to plant or something like that and you come in and you're sweating, that's physical activity. Um, as opposed to when we talk about exercise, exercise is bodily exertion for the sake of and, and maintaining uh, physical fitness. Um, so this is dedicated time. So when you're going for a walk for, for, for the sake of getting a little bit stronger, a little bit um, healthier, that's exercise. So walking, cycling, aquafit, jogging uh, is a few of the examples. So what can kidney disease cause? So, uh, I mean, you guys have experienced this. So weakness, brittle bones, fatigue, high and low blood pressure, um, increased resting heart rate, um, stress and anxiety, difficulty with everyday activities, poor balance, poor sleep, and less spare time. And I know something that um, I heard a lot in my practice working with hemodialysis patients, in-center hemodialysis patients, and patients on the ward when they're sick, as an inpatient, is the fatigue especially really hits people. People are exhausted, um, especially, uh, I don't know if, uh, depending on if you're on PD versus hemodialysis, um, hemodialysis after a session, people can be especially tired. Um, and so if we look though at exercise, why is it important? A lot of the things that we just talked about, exercise can help reverse or at least help to try and mitigate against. So when we talk about weakness, so again, hemodialysis, for instance, will take protein out of your blood which is why if you've talked to the dietitian, often you need more protein intake as a dialysis patient. Um, it helps to increase muscle mass and strength, right? It can help build your muscles back up. It improves your heart function. Um, your weight management, it helps. Energy levels, it improves sleep quality and quantity. Uh, blood sugar control, anxiety and depression, like Dr. Mike Evans said, uh, improves physical functioning and overall quality of life. And these are shown too, like not only in the general population, but in populations with chronic kidney disease. So again, this is just an example, again, of all the things kind of exercise can do, and it's just put into an image, but it's everything I just talked about. So especially for the heart, so people with kidney disease have four to six times higher rates of cardiovascular disease than the regular population, and that's just kind of chronic kidney disease as a whole. When you get to end-stage renal disease, 
where you're on dialysis, the rate actually goes up. So closer to like 10 times. So it becomes especially important to do exercise and try and help mitigate that risk. And so what are the different types of exercise? Again, exercise is kind of a, a big term. And so we're going to run through quickly uh, the four different types that I've kind of sorted it into. And I am going to ask you guys to do a little bit of them, even before Celia gets to you. Um, and so the first one is just kind of flexibility or stretching exercises. Um, you hear about this with yoga. Yoga is a big one for this, or Pilates, although they also have strengthening components involved. Um, so they just an exercise that puts a little bit of tension on our muscles and joints and helps maintain or increase our flexibility. So again, you should fe feel a little bit of tension, but something that I often hear from people, and again, you've gone too far in this case, was uh, it feels painful. So again, ease up if you're feeling that pain. Um, and something else that people do all the time during exercise is hold their breath. And don't hold your breath. Deep breaths the whole time. OK, so the first one, if you guys can just scoot back in your chair so you have a little bit of space in front of you. So you can just, like, I think all your chairs have wheels, so you can literally just move back. And then you can see that this lady, so she's got one leg forward. Yeah. So one leg forward. So you might have to scoot forward on your chair a little bit to be able to straighten your leg out. And then the other leg is bent. And so keeping your back nice and straight, lean forward. And you'll feel the straight leg, you can feel a bit of a stretch. If you can't feel it, yep, you got it, OK. If you can't feel a stretch, make sure your back's nice and straight. And make sure you're just leaning forward until you feel that gentle stretch. And try and hold that for a few seconds. So what we're doing here is we're stretching our hamstring muscle, something that often gets very tight in a lot of people. Again, a lot of sitting, where the hamstring is in a very short position. This helps to do that. Good. OK, we'll move on to the next one. So what are balance exercises? So balance exercises help to train your brain joints and muscles to kind of work together, steady yourself, and prevent falls. And they can be done while trying to stay still or, or while moving. So we'd call that, in physio language, static or dynamic. And so they should be a little bit challenging. But again, just like the stretching, you don't want to push yourself too far too quickly. Especially with balance exercises, we're trying to make it so you have better balance. We don't want you to fall, obviously. Uh, and so sometimes it's good to either have someone there with you or ensure you have something to hold on to. So let's try this. So if everyone can stand up. You have the table in front of you. Have both hands hovering over the table. You can hold on if you want at the beginning. So one of the ways that physiotherapists try and challenge your balance, oh, and I'm probably in front of the, sorry, um, is we kind of make your, we call it your base of support, but your feet kind of closer together. So I always think of the analogy as the difference between a sumo wrestler, where you think they've got a huge stance, or like American football, where the linemen are trying to push each other. They don't put their feet together. They put them wide, because it gives them a nice, good base of support to push. Whereas a gymnast walking on the balance beam, right, has a narrow base of support. So if we put our feet together, take your hands off. For a lot of you, this might be very easy. If that is the case, try and lift one leg up. So again, what you've done there is you've shifted. Yeah, and that's going to be harder. So again, keep your hands closer. So if you can, try and hold it there. Great. And now, for, for most people, that will be enough. Don't do the next thing I'm going to tell you. But there's a few people here who look like that's pretty easy. Close your eyes if you're one of those people. Because what we've done there is we've taken away another, yeah, so that gets pretty hard, yeah. We've taken another one of the systems that our body uses to try and give ourselves some balance. So again, this is just one type of, of exercise for that. We'll move to the next kind. So strengthening exercises. We can all have a seat. I'm going to get you to stand in a second again, though. Um, so strengthening exercises uh, involve flexing, or again, physios would call it contracting a muscle, usually against resistance. It can be just against um, gravity, though, which is still resistance. It's your body weight. Uh, and it causes the muscle basically to break down in tiny little ways, and then the muscle rebuilds itself stronger. So this is Popeye. Um, but uh, it's really important in strengthening exercises to pay attention to form. So a lot of people increase the resistance. So let's say if I'm using a one pound dumbbell, I go to five pounds way too quickly. Um, control the resistance. So you shouldn't be going really quickly. Like you see some people, especially guys in the gym, going really quickly. That doesn't help anything. You should have lots of control over your reps. Um, you should not be holding your breath. 
A little muscle soreness is OK, but it shouldn't cause pain. Again, no pain. Uh, and again, it's important to progress slowly. Again, muscles will rebuild. Usually, we see strength increases on the order of weeks, not days. And so if you're doing it, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Of course. What is the difference between the muscle soreness yeah. and not causing pain? Because if your muscles are mm -hmm. sore, sure. no matter what, it causes pain. It's so a very good question. Confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. So. It depends on, I guess, when, when you're causing pain. So let's say I'm in the middle of doing a repetition. So I'm, I'm lifting something, um, like a weight, whatever, a dumbbell, and I'm causing pain in the moment as I'm doing the exercise, then you're lifting too much weight. It shouldn't cause pain. You can have so soreness, like, a, like an ache, an achy feeling almost. That's OK. Because you might have achy feelings too. If you've done a big workout and you haven't done that in a little while, let's say you've, some friends have come to visit you and they want to go for a hike or a walk or something like that, and you haven't done this in a long time, two days later even, you might feel sore. Everybody's usually felt that at some point in their life. You're, you're doing something, like somebody's encouraged you to do something, and you're like, man, I don't know if I should do this. But then you do it anyways to participate, and you feel sore the next couple of days. We call that delayed onset muscle soreness. So it's your muscle rebuilding. It's, you've over, not overdone it, but you've, you've worked it really hard. Yeah. And now the muscle is trying to rebuild. So when I say no pain, and Feel free to jump in if you want, Celia. I don't mean like some soreness is OK. But I mean that acute pain, almost like pinching, like sharp pain, we don't want to feel. Does that make sense? And for folks with arthritis, um, a little bit of soreness in your joint is OK, especially if you're doing light resistance exercise. So let's say just someone jumps on the bike. The bike is a really good exercise for folks with, like, let's say, knee or hip arthritis, because there's, there's not a lot of impact going through your joints. And so you might get a little bit of soreness at the beginning, but a lot of people feel that they get better. It's like when someone with arthritis wakes up in the morning, often they're sore, but then as they get moving, they feel better. And that's because the joint self-lubricates. So um, not a problem. So OK, see, I'm getting you to stand up again. Lots of exercise for a lecture on exercise. Um, so again, this one, it's, it shows him holding onto the chair, but you can just hold onto the table if you like. And here we're just going to do a little squat. And so the biggest mistake I often see people do with the squat, and again, feel free to chime in, Zelia, is people often, if you watch, can everyone see my knees? Yeah? Usually people end up going forward like this. I don't want you to do that. You all have chairs behind you. Don't sit on them, but pretend like you're going down to sit. So sticking your bum out and backwards. So out and backwards. Again, holding onto the table in front of you for balance, nice and slow, good control. Your feet can be about shoulder width, out and backwards. Yeah. And so you're going to feel it mostly for this muscle. You'll feel it in your quadriceps, in your front of your thighs, and maybe in your back, the glutes. So all very good muscles to practice. Yeah. Good. So two more, everyone. I'm watching you guys. Very good. OK. And you guys can just stay standing now, because we're going to do another one. Um, so what's aerobic exercise? And so when he's talking about uh, walking as the big exercise, um, it's generally considered more of an aerobic exercise or a cardio exercise than, um, let's say, a resistance exercise. You might feel soreness. Your muscles might need to get a little bit more efficient. But it's not going to build them up the same way. If you look at the power walkers in the Olympics, they're not great big hulking guys or women. They're usually quite thin. Um, but their hearts and their lungs are wildly efficient. So I don't know if anyone's ever been to Berlin, but these are the funny walking people there. Um, but anyways, with cardio and aerobic exercise, it's good to have a, a warm up and a cool down period. So you don't want to go right into it. You, want, you don't want to go from zero to 100. So again, all we're going to do is we're going to march on the spot. And so let's see. I'm going to watch the clock. Let's try and do this for a minute. And if you need to stop at 10 seconds, stop at 10 seconds. It's OK. There's no worries. Everybody's challenge, something that's challenging for somebody is going to be easy for somebody else. And it's all good. So we'll start now. So just marching, try and do high knees. If you need to hold on to the table, hold on to the table for balance. So we've done about 30 seconds. 
You still got another 30 seconds. If it's too easy, you can go faster. Yeah, you're getting really high knees. That's great. Showing off. Yeah, exactly. Showing off. That's right. <laughs> That's OK. So again, you, you might start to feel a little bit of sweating as your body tries to cool itself. You might start to find you're having trouble if you were to try and talk to someone. You might be trying to catch your breath a little bit. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Five more seconds. But again, the muscles that help you breathe and the muscle that is your heart, when we train it like this, it becomes more efficient. We're good. So now you can have a seat for a little bit. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Yeah, so they all become more efficient. And so that's what he was talking about. And that has all the different benefits that we talked about. Again, quality of life, anxiety, depression. Um, uh, he talked about it a little bit like hypertension. But another thing that I saw in the literature um, in terms of renal disease is that the heart rate variability. So again, people with chronic kidney disease often have a high resting heart rate. Your heart rate's better able to respond to exercise when you do exercise. So if you're in a moment of, of uh, I don't know, you're running to catch the bus, let's say, or whatever it is, like you are anxious about something, your heart is better, better able to respond to that when you're exercising, which makes sense, right? If that walk that your friends tried to go on before, that hike that got you all sore, if you did that all the time, it wouldn't make you sore, right? And so it's really important to just build this into our routines. I couldn't do a, a lecture without posture, and I am certainly no, I don't know, hero when it comes to this stuff, it's hard. We live in a very sedentary society. And so you can see that the good posture, it's not as though, it's not like the military, where it's like their back is completely straight. There's natural curvature to your spine. So there's always going to be a little bit of an indent, or not always, but in good posture, there's a little bit of an indent in your low back and a little bit of a uh, kind of, I don't know, pro. Anyways, your upper back's going to jut out a little bit, and that's normal, OK? But, uh, but it's important not to overdo it. So you'll see people, there's certain conditions that people can't control. There's something like called kyphosis, where that upper part of your spine, your thoracic spine, ends up, that is accentuated, or lordosis, where the bottom part is also accentuated, and you have a little bit of this. But it's important, basically, what I always find is to try and tuck your chin in, sit back when you're sitting, and I'll, I'll show you some sitting posture in a sec and try not to lean forward so much. A lot of us are leaning forward so that our heads are forward, we're leaning forward like this, our shoulders are forward, so it's important to try and sit up nice and tall and pull our shoulders back, which is kind of what this shows you. So again, we do a lot of sitting. Uh, in my new job, more than ever, I'm sitting at a desk, and so I'm trying to, to, to listen to this. So again, it's leaning back into your chair, using that backrest having your arms nice and supported in front of you. If you're looking at a screen, having it be below you. Um, you should have your feet flat on the floor, your thighs all supported. Um, yeah. Any questions about anything so far? OK, good. So again, where are we going to start? I think walking. Walking is something that most people can do. And while it, it does sound like, oh, only walking, there's, it makes a huge difference. Again, in the time that I practiced in uh, the Dallas unit and stuff, when people implemented a walking program, they found it, it affected, again, a huge part of their life. They felt much happier. When their family came to visit them, they could go for much longer walks than they could previously. Um, and so it's, it's definitely worth trying. This is a sample walking program that uh, at St. Michael's Hospital, we provide to the cardiac surgery patients. Um, and the reason I put it up here is because you can see that as someone goes from kind of a beginner to more advanced, the number of walks might decrease over the course of a day, but the minutes per walk will increase. So at the beginning, when someone has cardiac surgery, we're trying to retrain them, right? Just like if someone hasn't done exercise in a long time. We're going to do six five-minute walks a day. What does that give us? It gives us 30 minutes of exercise. But as we go, we want them to do that 30 minutes in one go. So again, what did uh, Dr. Evans talk about? He said, again, 30 minutes of exercise every day, 23 and a half hours, right? You're allowed to be sitting or sleeping or whatever. But 30 minutes, we should try and be active. So this is kind of what the walking program gives you. We also have a whole bunch of handouts that we'll give you at the end, um, one of which is uh, American Heart Association walking program. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. But it, that just gives you a general sense. OK, I often get this question. And it's, how hard should I work? And 
that's a hard question to answer because I think most people want um, some sort of objective measure, a number. It's like, how hard should I be working? How far should I be walking? How long should I be walking? Um, and that's really for you guys to determine. A lot of this is subjective, how you feel. So especially, for instance, when I was doing um, exercise with <coughs> folks on dialysis, so they were on dialysis as I did exercise, this was the best way for them to judge whether they're working hard enough or not. And I would argue when you're going out for a walking program or something like that, this is probably still one of the best ways to do it. And so um, it's called the rate of perceived exertion. And it's basically how hard do I feel like I'm working. And so there's different ways you can describe it. So like again, <coughs> level one and two is light or very light. Um, and then three to five is kind of moderate to hard. And again, that's hard to perceive. It's like, what is hard, right? Pe we, we like, we're a society that likes objective measures. Um, and so one of the ways you can do that is the walk and talk test. So I talked about that a little bit a few minutes ago, where it was, if I'm walking with someone, if I'm walking with my wife or something, and I can't get a word in because I am just huffing and puffing, I'm probably pushing myself too much. I need to slow down. I need to have a rest, OK? Whereas if I'm really easy, I can like whatever, talk forever, probably she says I talk too much, then I need to work a little harder. So this is a rate of perceived exertion scale that was made for kids, but I don't, like, I like it. I really like it. Just because it gives you lots of different ways to look at it. And so even the face, I think, is really good. And so if you look at, for instance, number five, like, what they might be thinking is, this exercise is a good workout. I'm working really hard. And again, for different people, that's going to mean different things. For somebody who hasn't walked in a long time, maybe it's they've gone for a kilometer, they've done a loop of their block, and that was really hard. For someone who's walking all the time, maybe they just did five kilometers and they walked it at a brisk pace. The other thing is it describes kind of what they might be feeling. So again, in number five, which is about as hard as you probably need to work going for a walk, it says, my cheeks are getting pink, I'm getting a little sweaty. So again, it just describes on what you're feeling. We don't want to get into like number nine where it's, I need a break, this is very hard, my face looks red, I feel like I need to stop. Like, you don't need to push yourself that hard to get the same benefits. So how often and how long? And that's where Dr. Evans was talking about dosing a little bit. So aerobic, again, generally three to five times a week, 20 to 60 minutes, or you can do it in 10 minute bounce. So for a total, we're looking for 150 minutes a week. Um, if you did a half hour a day, that's actually more than that. So strengthening, if you did them two to three days a week, that's great. Uh, two to four sets of eight to 12 repetitions. And then flexibility and balance, you can do two to five days a week, or varies. Um, as always, like, you don't want to push through symptoms. Uh, and so if you feel lightheaded, dizzy, headache, blurred vision, nausea, feeling shaky, confusion, difficulty breathing, chest pain, racing heartbeat, leg cramps, severe sharp pain, stop, rest. If you feel that and it's not going away and you're concerned, obviously seek medical attention. But a lot of these will end up going away if you just rest for a little bit. Obviously, the chest pain and stuff like that is a little bit more concerning. Um, but try not to push yourself too hard. Keeping safe while exercising. So it's important to watch your balance. So a lot of, I mean, one of the primary causes of kidney disease right now is diabetes. And so then coming with that is peripheral neuropathy, where we lose, start to lose feeling in our feet, um, as well as retinopathy. We sometimes have poor vision. And a lot of folks have inner ear changes. So it affects their balance. And so it's important to watch your balance. Because especially these, um, uh, when you have those conditions, and like we talked about chronic kidney disease, can affect your bone density, and so you have more brittle bones. And so you're at more increased risk of fractures, and your injuries after you have them will heal slower. Um, there's a few specific things too. So um, if anyone has a fistula or graft, we don't want to have prolonged bending. So for instance, let's say you were doing uh, an exercise where you're bending your arm like this. You don't want to go all the way to the end and keep it there for a long time. Um, you don't want to lift more than 10 pounds. And so I always think of that as like, think of like a bag of milk. So that's four liters. Four liters is about four kilos. And so we're getting about 10 pounds. Um, and then avoid compressing the arm. So where the fistula and the graft are, you don't want to provide excess pressure. Um, if you have a tunneled line, um, again, you guys know that you shouldn't be swimming or bathing. Um, and then obviously stop exercising if you notice pain, bleeding, or swelling. Um, with PD, it's important to avoid vigorous exercise when your abdomen is full. Again, you can probably go for a walk though. Um, avoid abdominal exercises, so don't, don't do your crunches when your, your uh, abdomen is full. And then it's also important, obviously, to keep your line clean and dry. 
So again, one of the other resources we have printed for you guys is uh, a list of community resources. So if you're more interested in the kind of a structured program, there's a few that we've put on our uh, a list. Um, some more structured that you might need like a physician referral for, like a rehab, some at your local community centers, and some uh, the government provides some limited funding for physiotherapy uh, in clinics, and so there's that resource there too. The other thing too that Teddy's team at the back, hi Teddy, um, kind of found was uh, University Hospital Network, uh, or Health Network I should say, uh, came out with a uh, basically maps of all the malls in the GTA. And it gives you like the route and how far you've walked if you've done that route. And so that's kind of neat if you guys are mall walkers. And I always think mall walking is great, especially when it gets to bad weather. Because we have a long period in this country of bad weather where it can be hard to walk outside. I, I much prefer walking outside in weather like this even. But when it gets to snow and ice, it's nice to walk in a mall that's temperature controlled. There's people around. There's often benches at different intervals. And so walking in a mall is a, a great idea. So again, uh, exercise like everything else can come with a risk. You have the risk of musculoskeletal injury, and I gave the example of a, a sprained ankle. That's all that, that means. Having said that, if you're doing exercise appropriately, you're often going to prevent those injuries, right? Because you're going to strengthen the muscles that will help support the joints and stuff like that. You also have the risk of having a cardiac event. But having said that, like we talked about, exercise done appropriately will help to mitigate that risk and will reduce that risk of having that event. And so while these are risks, it's your risk of, of having these events probably without exercise is probably higher. So Ian has compiled a great set of exercises to do. You can do them two to three times a week. That would be ideal. This is something that you can take home. It's nice and concrete, OK? All right. So um, important things to note is that I do want you to make sure that you're breathing through the exercises. Okay, don't hold your breath at any time. And, um, and when you're doing the exercise, like Ian mentioned before, it's important to do them with control, thinking about your movements, not sloppy or quick, okay? All right, so the first one is taking a diaphragmatic breath. So what I want you to do is I want you to sit up nice and tall. I want you to put your hands on your belly. Good. When you breathe in, I want you to think of your belly as like a balloon and it being filled with air. So when you breathe in, your tummy should come out. And then exhale, it deflates. Let's try again. Breathe in. And then exhale. It's best to breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. Try one more time. In through your nose. And exhale. Perfect. Next exercise. Just simply bring in your ear to your shoulder and feel a nice good stretch there of your muscles on your neck. Wonderful. Good. Let's try the other side. Stretch it out. Good. Ears to your shoulder, okay? Whereas the next one, you're rotating. You're rotating. Look over your right shoulder. Good. And the other way. Right over. Beautiful. <laughs> And you would do these three times each on each side, OK? Please interrupt me if you have any questions. This one here is a little tricky to do, but it's very important, especially with the posture that we're talking about, how we do tend to, with everything we do in life, we tend to just kind of jut our heads forward on a computer, on our phone. So we want to do the opposite. Sit up nice and tall. And I want you to think about bringing your chin and tuck it in so your head is rotating, OK? So if you need to put your finger in there, go ahead on your chin and do like a double chin. <laughs> Good. And you should feel the stretch right here in the back of your neck. OK, good. And make sure when you're doing this, you're not looking down. You're looking forward. 
Okay, so I see some of you doing that. Look forward and tuck in. Good. Okay. Picture here, you can do it lying down or you can do it sitting up. Okay. This is a very hard one for people to get. Yeah. If you're not getting it the first time, you're probably like most people. Yeah. It's basically the opposite. If you think of someone with really bad posture, I'm going like this. this. These muscles are very tight, short. These are very long. We're trying to reverse that. So we're trying to tuck this in. Mm-hmm. Good. Straight back. Wonderful. As well for posture, the next exercise, I want you to sit up nice and tall again. I want you to put your, let's see what it says. You're going to be bringing your shoulder blades together. So you're squeezing them together. And I'll show you where you should be feeling it. So sit up right up nice and tall and bring your shoulder blades together. And you should feel it right down the middle of your back. Perfect. That one's good. And you should make crinkles in there, wrinkles right in there in between your shoulders. Squeeze them together. Good. And relax. And you do that a couple more times. Okay? Relax. And then squeeze them. Those chicken wings. <laughs> Very good. And that will open up this whole, your whole chest part. Okay? Good. Next one. Again, sitting up nice and tall, bringing your thumbs up. Sure. Do you have a question? Or no, you're doing the exercise. <laughs> right up. Beautiful. And down. Let's do five times. Up and down. It's best to do thumbs up. It's just a little easier on our shoulders. So if you can rotate your hands a little. Beautiful, nice high okay. switch hands. If this was easy, you could always add a weight. I didn't have a weight in the yeah. original because not everyone can add weight. Good. If you have like a one pound weight or something like that, sometimes people use like a Campbell's soup can, like a little one, mm. which would be like a pound, and then like a water bottle would be like two pounds. Right. You can often find like cheap weights like that at Walmart or Amazon, or I'm not suggesting any in particular place, mm -hmm. but you can mm -hmm. find them in a lot of places. And just remember, if you were to do this with bad posture, you're not going to get far and it's going to hurt. So remember to sit up nice and tall, bring those shoulder, shoulder blades together, tuck in your tummy, and right up. Okay? Nice and controlled. If it hurts, you stop. If it hurts your shoulder. But otherwise, you should be able to get all the way up. Feel a good stretch in there, too. Okay? Good. Next one is for your elbow. Let's go back to the other hand. Elbow tucked into your side. And just up and down. And like Ian says, you can add a weight if this is too easy. A nice light weight is fine. For most people, this could be weight based. You do this all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we just don't have weights for this many people. You also see that, again, this is like the classic, people do this weight too often at the gym, curl. Yeah. But, um, but it is a good exercise. Keep your bicep up. Good. And keep your elbow and to the side. Good. And again, if you have a fistula or a grasp, it's important yeah. to go right to the end and really push. And I guess this exercise is with a weight. Yeah. So Same like thing. That was, yeah. It's just, this is just triceps. So oh, it's triceps. Sorry. So if you figure on the front of your arm, biceps on the front, triceps on the back, what does the bicep do? It bends your arm. What does the triceps do? It straightens your arm. It straightens your elbow. So there's a lots of ways you can work this. You could do a wall push up, something like that. But the way I just did is you got it. It's just mm -hmm. like this. And Bring the arm up. Pan, you can do this. Because again, what am I doing? I'm straightening my elbow, and gravity would be pulling the Campbell soup can down as I try and straighten it back up. Good. So Straighten the elbow. Yep. Straighten the elbow. So keep your arm there. If you want, put your other hand here, yep. and just straighten the elbow. Yeah, you can hold your arm up if you want, if that's easier. Yep. Good. Wonderful. All right, let's make a little room. Next one is kicking. Now, this is not kicking like how I said kicking. <laughs> it's nice and controlled. Straighten until your knee gets all the way straight and bend. Think about those muscles here in your quads, nice and strong, nice and controlled. Beautiful. Wonderful. 
The next one was a hamstring stretch, which Ian did already, yep. with your leg out to your side and stretching forward so you can feel that stretch along the back of your leg. Okay? Beautiful. Good. Good. And do the other side. The next one here is in sitting. You can do in sitting. And what you'll do is raise up your heels. Good. So you're tightening those muscles here in the back of your leg and your calves. Good. Nice and high. As high as you can go. And down. And up. And down. And up. And down. 10 to 15 times. Both at the same time is fine. Good. Wonderful. Now we'll stand up. Good. You can hold to onto the back of the chair or hold the table. You might need a little room for this one. Good. And what I want you to do is bring your leg out to the side. So start with one side, out, and in. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you do a little one. Yep. So don't look like you're making a snow angel. Out and in. Nice and control. Toes pointing forward. Yeah. Think about bringing your heel out to the side. Yeah. Good. Good. Switch sides. So again, try and keep your toe like Shelly said, pointing forward. Don't let it go out like this. Mm -hmm. Don't let it make an L. Keep it forward. And if you can only go this high, not, not. Toes pointing forward, <laughs> like this. Good. So you really work those muscles on your hips, on your side. Good job. Wonderful. Good. Yeah. Yep. So it'll just be where's the resistance coming from. So for instance, lying down, you're not gonna have resistance of gravity. Your gravity is gonna be pushing your leg down. It's not going to be resisting you doing a snow angel movement. Okay. This gravity is actually resisting you doing a snow angel movement. So it really depends on your physio will have assessed that it's supposed to your strength and how if you're able to do it correctly or not, like this. Yeah, so this is a hip abduction exercise. So <laughs> Literally, it's just the muscles that are bringing your hip and your leg away from your body. Hip abduction, abduction hip. Um, that's all this is. And it's a muscle group, specifically like the muscle we're trying to train is gluteus medius. It's really weak in a lot of people and it's actually correlated with like muscle falls and stuff. So it's really mm -hmm. good for balance exercises. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that might be why. It's just different levels of resistance, long story short. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Okay. Next one. Up on your tippy toes. Go up as high as you can and down. Let's do 10 times. Good. Three feet. Okay. Everything else? You need to hold on in front of you? Just yes. <laughs> Good. Feel those calves tighten up. Try to go slow on the way down, too. Remember control. Yes. Nice and controlled. Excellent. Wonderful. The mini squat, which um, he demonstrated earlier, so let's just do a couple of them. Remember, you're trying to stick out your bottom like you're going to sit, and then up. Hold on to something. Down and up. And if it's more comfortable, you can bring your feet up, you know, hip width apart, okay? Doesn't have to be close together. It's probably better not to. Good. Good. Just like you're going to sit and up. Wonderful. Okay. The next exercise is more of a stretch, right? Oh, yeah. Bring your leg, one leg back, and lean into the front leg. So you feel a stretch all the way. So, yeah, you're looking to feel doing this right? Back, but you might not. If you're really, really flexible, 
Yes. And make sure your toes are pointing forward again. Okay, not out to the side. Good. Wonderful. The last two we can do sitting down. So have a seat. You guys did great. <laughs> Good. Sit up nice and tall, bring one arm over and stretch out your side. <coughs> stretch, 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 stretch. Good. Hold it there. Good. And the other way. And right over, right over, right over. Beautiful. Excellent. Three times each, each way would be great. Okay. And the last one is a trunk rotation. So hold yourself and twist, twist, twist over. Get your head over, your shoulders over as, as far as you can. Good. And the other way. Look behind you. Try to get a good stretch in your spine there. Wonderful. Good job. That's for you. Thank you. Thank you.